Today on this episode of The Crossover, we will be discussing sleep learning with Professor and Chair of Psychology at Northwestern University, Dr. Ken Paller. Learn how sleep is essential for brain health and critical for memory consolidation, elevated concentration, and enhanced focus. Much more on this episode of The Crossover. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Ken Paller, world-renowned sleep expert at Northwestern, talking about sleep learning. Hey, Ken, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Listen, thanks for thanks for joining us, and, and I appreciate your time here on a Friday afternoon. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. I'm going to do a, a brief introduction just while everyone's logging on. We have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Ken Powler, uh, who is a world-renowned sleep expert. Uh, he is professor of psychology at Northwestern University, as well as director of their cognitive neuroscience program. Uh, he conducts cognitive neuroscience research focused on human memory and consciousness. Uh, more specifically, his recent articles have examined sleep's role in memory and memory dysfunction, sensory processing during sleep to reinforce prior learning, and the neural substrates of conscious memory experiences. As background, Dr. Powell received his undergraduate degree from UCLA and then PhD in neuroscience from UC San Diego. He subsequently did postdocs at Yale, Manchester, and Berkeley. He is a fellow of the Mind and Life Institute, a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science, and program committee chair for the Cognitive Neuroscience Society. And he's here to discuss the ever interesting topic of sleep learning. Are we able to actually improve our learning and memory and actually learn new topics during sleep? So very excited to speak with you today, Ken. Thanks for joining us. Sure thing. So I guess let's just start with basics for our listeners. What is sleep learning in your understanding? I think we have to have two definitions of it. So one type, the type that has been thought about in past decades is acquiring new knowledge during sleep. The type I'm more interested in is how learning continues after the initial information comes in. And so sleep is part of our ability to form good memories and keep them and integrate them with other things we know. In other words, it's a process of consolidating memories that sleep contributes to so that when we're awake, we can then have the information that we've learned previously. Well, tell us a little bit about what happens physiologically, both in the brain and the body overall during sleep. Well, there are tons of changes. Uh, and, and you know, the, the key change seems to be that you're not responsive and you're not moving. So the body is in this quite different state, quite vulnerable in a sense. And it seems as if you're tuned out. And from the first person perspective, it seems like your whole body is off. Just like if I shut down a computer, if I put my computer to sleep, nothing happens. And then it comes back a later, later. And, you know, mentally, it almost seems like that, although we remember a dream now and then. We remember having a good or a poor night of sleep. But the fact is, our brain is quite busy and active during all of sleep. And it uses that for restorative functions. But in addition, for bringing up information that's been acquired during the day and progressing on this process where, why, whereby we consolidate memories. And of course, we need uh, memory function, not just to reminisce about the past, but to make good judgments to how our actions be informed by how uh, prior actions have gone and to be creative and to come up with new ideas. So all that's part of this processing that happens mostly with, without our knowledge during sleep. So we're not aware that our brain is busy for the most part. And yet that work is happening and we wake up a little different after a night of sleep. Well, let me ask you a question, because <laughs> you mentioned dreams, and obviously everyone dreams. Some people kind of remember them more often than others. What, I mean, do we understand why we dream? What's the purpose? Why some people always remember their dreams, other people almost never? Yeah, there, there are quite a few things packed in there. So we have still a lot more to learn about dreams. So it's really an exciting research area. Uh, and... Uh, as you mentioned, everyone has dreams. Not everyone remembers dreams. So the interesting feature about dreams is they're not necessarily remembered well. Uh, and in the morning, you may or may not understand that you've been having dreams. So why do we remember some and not others? Well, 
One of the explanations for that is that our brain is sort of in a different state. The brain areas are working differently during sleep, not in a way that allows us to learn new information for the most part. But if you momentarily wake up, then your brain is shifted and you're able to take whatever was just on your mind and now remember all that. So we think dreams are especially memorable if there's awakening right at the end of a dream or sometime during a dream. And it could be just a momentary awakening, a so-called micro arousal, in which case you may not remember waking up, but you still might have changed your brain enough so that you can then have that dream to remember later. You've also asked about the functions of dreams. So is it helpful to remember dreams for some brain function? Well, we don't know that and possibly it isn't necessary to remember a dream but we think that brain function is probably very important whether you remember the dream or not and the brain function is what i was talking about before this consolidation of memories working through things that happened recently and connecting them with things that happened farther in the past and putting all that together in a way that's stored effectively so you have it when you need it now going back to sleep learning kind of transitioning from dreams the official sleep learning website seems a little bit aggressive when they talk about you buy these CDs and during sleep you can learn a new language, improve self-esteem, overcome allergies, all these things that would be great to do self-improvement while you're sleeping. Is any of this true? Yeah, well, I have no idea what this website is that you're <laughs> discussing or who put it up. Uh, so I wouldn't give much credence to it. But the story is rather interesting. Yeah. That in the 1940s, you know, 80 years ago, uh, there had been research on this topic about learning new information. And then in the 1950s, there were some studies showing that if people learn something during sleep, it was probably because they were awake for a moment. And the, the earlier studies didn't use EEG recordings, so they really couldn't confirm whether people were awake or asleep. And the new studies showed that that was all wrong. So that started about a 50 year period, you know, the dark ages of research in that area. No one wanted to investigate that anymore. So sleep research, research stayed away from it because it looked like it was all, you know, a mistake and that people, you know, didn't really learn anything during sleep. But now we've gone back and looked again. And of course, with careful measuring to determine whether people are awake and asleep at any given moment, there is some evidence for some sleep learning. It's rather restricted. So the idea from Aldous Huxley of just learning a whole new language, you know, here, by hearing a speech one night like the little boy in his story did. Well, that's not going to happen. But some learning is possible. It's not really strong learning. It's, in some sense, uh, very basic sensory learning or what we call implicit learning, which is acquiring knowledge that you don't know you acquire and then having it even though you don't know you have it. Uh, and there's a few other examples. Like in one of our studies, we did have someone remember the whole episode that had happened to them. And that's because they were in a dream and their dream wasn't a regular dream, but it was a special dream that's called a lucid dream. They knew they were dreaming at the time and they knew that there was gonna be some communication happening. And when they woke up, they remembered all of that. So that's sleep learning. It's acquiring new conscious memories during sleep. It's very rare. So that's the, the, the kind of advertising you're talking about. It's, it's, the, you know, it's basically an urban legend that's been around a long time that, you know, Advertisers may talk about incredible things learned during sleep, and there isn't much good evidence for a lot of that, but we're going back and we're finding out, well, what, what types of learning can happen, mainly reinforcing prior learning uh, that is possible to, to push during sleep? Because I mentioned that during sleep, you're bringing up past memories, but which memories? Are you remembering the important names of the people you met so you can remember their names the next day, or are you remembering some advertising that you'd rather not remember. So we can perhaps tweak that a bit by trying to control what happens while you're asleep with some sounds that we can present that is, is really part of a research method that has helped us try to understand what's happening in the brain when this processing is happening. But it's also potentially an application uh, that could be used for people that wanna learn something particular better and for example, stroke patients who are trying to recover with a rehab program to learn to have better arm function because of the damage that was done with the stroke, but they want to do rehab and through neuroplasticity, of course, try to reacquire 
some of their abilities. And we're asking the question, can we help that learning proceed better by trying to take advantage of sleep? And, and again, I'm saying our sleep is good for our learning every night, potentially, but exactly what's happening and can we optimize it? Those are the interesting questions we're still asking now. So based on your research, based on our current understanding, there's not a particular skill or language or what have you that we can learn during sleep. It's not, you can't acquire something concrete during that time that you have identified yet. Yeah, well, it's a little more subtle than that because I would say if you're focusing on a skill during your day, like if you're a musician or an athlete really trying to learn something and you're spending a lot of time on that skill, you're probably spending time at night in your sleep on it too. And so that could be beneficial for you. So it is helping you with a skill. And that's true for motor learning. And in fact, for many, many types of learning. Uh, I mean, think about it. If you want to learn the names of some new people you met, what's the, what's the best way to do that? Well, it's rehearsal. You have to practice. And that's true for motor skill. You have to practice it again and again. And it turns out our brain is doing that practice for us without us knowing it during sleep. And so therefore, lots of learning depend on this to happen. But uh, I wouldn't, if I had something new I wanted to learn, I'd try to learn it while I was awake. <laughs> now, you had mentioned about kind of how we retain information, how we consolidate memories. And that's such an important aspect of neuroscience. Just go over what is the connection between sleep and how we consolidate our memories, the stuff that happened during the day and how it kind of gets locked in. Well, okay, we can talk a little bit about the neuroanatomy of that. Probably that's a good idea for, for yep. you uh, and your audience. Um, so that depends on what type of memory it is. So uh, neuropsychologists have distinguished between different types of memory because they depend on different brain areas. So let's talk about the typical type of memory you think about. It's remembering facts and remembering events, the episodes of our lives. You want to remember those details. Well, those are stored in different parts of the cerebral cortex depends on what kind of information it is. Is it sounds, sights, people's faces, emotions? And an episode will have, you know, all those sorts of things. And those different brain areas are involved in the cortex, but they have to be linked together to make it to be a good episode. So the cortex can work pretty well on its own, but it needs this other structure, the hippocampus, to help connect all those little pieces to actually form an episode that you can remember in the long term. So this interaction between those two areas, the hippocampus and the neocortex, is thought to be a critical part of consolidation. And we think that's going on for these memories, these facts and episodes that you're remembering during sleep. So that's one type of memory and the changes in the, in the brain through these two areas interacting that seems to happen and take time. It takes, you know, it doesn't happen when you first learn the names or whatever it is, this episodes, it takes time for that consolidation to go forward. And if you have brain damage, you're going to have trouble doing that. And damage to the hippocampus can even give you retrograde amnesia for things that happened before the damage, probably because of this consolidation process, that the consolidation hasn't gone forward enough. So those new memories aren't stored effectively in your brain uh, just when an event happens, but only after you think a little bit more about that event or unconsciously think about that event. And that can take place over time. Now, there's a lot of different phases to sleep, and there's REM and there's non-REM. When does the memory consolidation occur? Well, you know, the history of the research on that is also interesting because the older thinking in the you know, 1980s was it's got to be REM sleep because dreams are happening during REM sleep, and dreams might reflect this processing of uh, memories over and over again. And the, the research kind of stalled out because the evidence was mixed and didn't all fit together until people started focusing instead on slow wave sleep. So it seems that slow wave sleep is really a key time for memory processing and we can observe that happening during slow wave sleep. It's, you know, we have, we, if you first fall asleep, you go through a stage non-REM one, non-REM two, then non-REM three, that third one is slow wave sleep. So that happens prior to going to REM sleep and then repeating the cycle. And when the research focuses on slow wave sleep, we can see very interesting connections. The more slow wave sleep you have, the better the memory for the things you learned the prior day and things like that. So, so to answer your question, well, slow wave sleep is one of the very important parts of, the, of sleep. It's probably not the only part. So REM has a role. It's just a little bit more complex. 
stage two is kind of like slow wave sleep. So that's also important. And we get a lot of stage two every night. So um, probably all the different parts of sleep may play some role. And it's interesting to think, how is that role different uh, for the different areas? Like uh, uh, I mentioned dream and REM. So dreams happen during REM sleep, but not always. There are also dreams in other stages. And so there's not a one-to-one -one connection there. Uh, but perhaps uh, the type of uh, scenario that, that goes on in a dream, you know, uh, allows your brain to bring together disparate things and just see how they fit together. Because dreams, you know, include often bizarre things conjoined together that you wouldn't normally put together. And maybe that's a helpful part of our creativity that we bring out. Uh, and think about it, it's pretty interesting that, you know, some, some people are great writers and can come out with stories that are fascinating, but all of us do this amazing thing of forming dream stories that are fascinating and people love thinking about their dreams and what kind of things happened and trying to understand why that story popped into their head. Um, and, and, you know, another thing about dreams, just to throw it out there, is that in a dream that's not a lucid dream, you're experiencing these events and you think it's real. You think you're awake. So it's mistaken as thinking it's a wake experience. And it's very real life. So in fact, we normally in our waking experience, we have sensory input from our senses and we build an idea of where are you? What is your environment? What's going on? And our brain produces that for us. And during dream, our brain produces this for us and it didn't need any outside information whatsoever. And yet it's a real experience. So it kind of says that our experiences aren't just a read out of the world, they're something our brain does for us, whether or not there's a world out there giving us input. I mean, there's so much more to learn. I feel like we know so little, we're just scratching the surface. But so let's get into what happens if you don't get enough sleep. And so you went over how important sleep is for kind of consolidating memories, locking those in permanently. What has your research shown on people who don't get sufficient sleep? I guess, first of all, what is sufficient sleep? How much do you need? And what happens if, if we don't get that sleep? Are we not able to learn, not able to learn as well? What exactly happens? Yeah, okay, there's a lot in there. If you don't get sufficient sleep, of course, one of the problems you have is you're drowsy the next day and you may not learn things well in your drowsy and you may not remember things when you're drowsy. So that's part of the effect. And if you skip sleep uh, an entire night, for example, just do an all nighter, there might be a, a lot of ways that you're having trouble the next day. So it's not a specific memory problem there. So we're asking, well, what is the specific advantage to us in the memory function of sleep? That's a little bit more subtle. And so how much sleep does a person need? Well, we, we kind of know that varies from person to person. So we don't usually put an exact number on how much sleep is needed, but uh, rather a, 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 you know, a, a range of, of amount of sleep. And uh, uh, that changes uh, in development. So children get a lot more sleep. We get less as we grow older. Uh, people in older age groups get less, not necessarily because they need less, but because it's not, their circadian rhythms aren't quite working as well. So when I, when I think about what is sufficient sleep and what is good sleep quality, it should include the number of hours of sleep. And you might also say, well, how much of that was slow wave sleep? How much of that was REM sleep? And I'd even go further and say, if we could say, and what kind of memory processing are you doing during that sleep? Some people might, you know, have an hour of slow wave sleep and do very efficient memory processing and other people don't. So we need to understand the physiology, the brain physiology of this sleep to really say what is sufficient, what is sufficient to happen. And it, it's gonna be more than just a number of seven, eight hours. It's gonna be, how is that physiology working for us? So that's kind of why our current gauges, even with, you know, wearable technology, you get rough ideas of sleep. It's not necessarily telling you what the required amount is. So you're better off thinking, well, how am I during the day? Am I falling asleep or getting drowsy when I don't want to? That's a sign you're not getting enough sleep, first off. And is my memory function working well? That's also an issue there. And we think there's probably ways in which sleep is contributing to a whole set of mental and physical functions that may not be going as well if sleep isn't working for you. And so it, it's, it's got to be on our radar. It's got to be something we think about when you have any complaint of can, is sleep contributing to that? And can I do something to make my sleep better? Because there are good things to do. There isn't a magic pill 
to get great sleep, but there's what's called sleep hygiene. So you basically try to be sure you're doing the right things for having sleep, like sleeping the same uh, time, going to sleep and getting up at the same time of day, seven days a week. That's helpful. Not having too much caffeine late or alcohol, not having too much light exposure from your uh, devices before sleep and, you know, a whole set of other things that you can kind of do to make your sleep as good as it could be uh, with simple behavioral changes. Yeah, I mean, I feel like just like you said, I feel like there's not enough attention given to the importance of sleep. There's a lot of attention given to diet and nutrition. There's a lot of attention to exercise and kind of wellness. But only recently are we understanding the importance of getting good quality sleep, like you said, not only for your brain function and your memory, but also physiologically. There's new data showing that you know, lack of sleep leads to heart disease, leads to cancer, leads to inflammation, leads to early Alzheimer's, all these other diseases. Is there anything else that your research has shown in terms of the importance of good sleep? Well, we, we, we focused a lot on slow wave sleep and trying to see how uh, the amount of slow wave sleep is critical and can we enhance how much slow wave sleep people get. So there's some research trying to push on that and see, can we make slow wave sleep better for people? So that's in addition to sleep hygiene, can we you know, convince the brain to do more of the slow wave sleep? And it does decline when people get older, starting in your 20s or 30s even. And so perhaps it's contributing to Alzheimer's disease in the sense that it might play a role in removing things like amyloid and doing a better job at that. So that's sort of still an interesting research idea that we could uh, see how that's a, a potential risk factor and try to make it better uh, to give better outcomes for people. So yes, sleep is very important in, in the variety of ways that you mentioned and is a little bit harder for us to assess because you know we're, we're not there to watch while we're sleeping. So what's happening during sleep and is it working well? You have to kind of you know, go into get for a sleep study in a hospital or, you know, get some, you know, wearables that give you not as good information, but at least some information and try to figure out is, is sleep working for you or not. Uh, and, and, and kind of respect it a bit more. So you might, you might say, oh, I have so many things to get done. I'm really going to have to pull from something. So I'll just get less sleep. Well, that might not always be in your interest. So you kind of have to think about that and value sleep and respect it. It's up there, as you said, with diet and exercise and respecting your need for sleep. Now, you you had mentioned before, I just want to go back. Had you found any way to increase slow wave sleep since that's where the memory consolidation occurs? Were there any key tips that you'd give to our listeners if they want to improve their slow wave sleep? Well, I think we're not quite ready to say if there's technology that can do that, but there are various technologies that are being uh, tested out to see how well they could work. And some of them use sound stimulation to try to enhance the slow waves. And so it's, it's tantalizing that that could be helpful, but it isn't sort of ready for prime time use yet, I think, because uh, we need sort of more longitudinal studies. So, you know, it can work over one night or one afternoon in a nap, but what's it like in the long term? We're still trying to figure that out. Uh, and um, so I think that's that's kind of the answer. Is we we sleep hygiene is what we know works, <laughs> and the other methods we have to um, you know is there going to be a modern method where we control what's going on? That's a fascinating idea. Yeah, it's obviously a, just a huge area of research. But uh, when you talk about sleep learning, the idea of learning new skills or new languages and like listening to either voices or music when you sleep. What about the thought that that may be detrimental in the sense that trying to learn something new during sleep takes away from the, from the brain's ability to consolidate memories that happen during the day? Are, are we actually causing more harm by trying to learn something new? Yeah, I think we always have to be careful and look at what are, what are the unintended consequences of what we're doing. So always be watchful for that. It's a good idea. But, you know, I think you could say, your brain already knows the ideal way to consolidate things. And so maybe we shouldn't tinker with it because it's got evolution pressures have already got that well done. But, you know, a lot of us wear glasses and that helps us in a lot of ways. So, you know, things may not be optimized and we may actually be able to think about doing things better. And, and our, our tinkering with sleep 
is been interesting in, in the research we've been doing on REM sleep in particular, that gives us the opportunity to provoke a dream to go in a particular way. And so, for example, people that have nightmares, they would want their dream to go another way. And so if we can twist it around and make the dream go the way you want it to go, that could be very helpful. And you might want to dream about something in particular. You might want to dream about how to solve a problem you're working on, how to get better at your, you know, surgical skills that you're practicing or, you know, anything like that. So there's the potential for using our dream time that way. And that's been interesting for us just to mention real quickly, some of our recent studies have been trying to present stimuli, soft sounds during sleep, make sure that they don't disrupt your sleep, and then see if we can provoke someone into a lucid dream where they're, they're in the dream and they realize it's a dream while they continue to dream, and therefore they realize that it could change in a particular way. We can give them further input to suggest how the dream should change. We can ask them questions and they can think about the answer and emit the answer, not through their mouth because it's hard to talk while you're in REM sleep, but through their eyes, they can move their eyes, they can sniff and change their respiration. They can communicate with us during sleep and we can have this question and answer thing where we try to find out what's happening during sleep and some new work we're doing that's trying to connect this, these ideas with something that Tibetan Buddhists have been doing for hundreds of years, which is this phenomenon of dream yoga where they try to take advantage of their sleep time to uh, take different you know, steps towards their learning, their spiritual growth. And we're saying, well, how can you use your dreams for this whole variety of things that you might want to do? Skill learning or doing something you can't do while you're awake or, you know, enhancing some goals that you have in, in your life. So give us just a preview since this is I know we're running short on time and and you're super busy. Give us your crystal ball view. The biggest three breakthroughs in sleep and sleep learning that you predict in the next five, 10, 20 years that will happen based on research. You said sleep and sleep learning. Yeah, just I would say the overall sleep, in terms of our understanding of the importance of sleep, how to sleep better, how to utilize that time, learn, what are some breakthroughs that you see coming down the pipe? Yeah, well, the first one that came to mind is not really about my own research, but some of my colleagues like Phyllis Lee, who's a sleep doctor here, they're working on sleep and how it relates to metabolic function, metabolic disorders, and sort of eating behavior and obesity and you know all putting those things together how does sleep influence that we have to think about their circadian rhythms and i think there's some pretty interesting insights coming out of that sort of work that are critical for health not so much related to the memory function that i study so uh putting it back to more of what we do i think there's there's potential to uh have insights of how we might do what you could call sleep engineering so how do we not just lay down on the pillow and hope good stuff happens, but try to systematically control what's going to happen, take advantage of the brain power that's there and push it in the way we want to push it. For example, to, you know, avoid nightmares or change how that's happening. There's sort of new methods online that are just being tested about how we could um, do this kind of control. Sleep engineering is kind of one terminology for it, but it's, it's sort of, uh, uh, directing sleep in the way we want it to go to achieve certain goals and to optimize it. And I think that's, that looks to me to be an exciting breakthrough, both for just understanding brain function and, you know, why we're spending all this time sleeping, why do we have to do that and what does it get us? And then also for application. So how can we make use of it in a rehab context, like I mentioned, or in other uh, important cases where we want to make use of our knowledge. So it's, it's got these two things that are always uh, together, both the um, uh, just acquiring more knowledge about brain function and then asking how we can apply that in circumstances where it would be helpful. Even, you know, kids trying to learn as they're growing up. One of the ideas that's come out of sleep research is, well, maybe we shouldn't start our school so early. <laughs> maybe we should figure out when kids need to sleep and how much time should be allotted so they're not overloaded with, with things they have to do. So I think there are important kind of societal implications about allowing for sleep and figuring out how people that are shift workers and are working overnight, how, to, how should they cope and how, what can we do to make their lives better because of the difficulties of not getting regular sleep at regular times. 
I mean, it's so fascinating. Just like you said, every single animal on this planet, every single organism sleeps and humans sleep a third of our lives. So the question of why do we sleep and how important it is, clearly over millions of years, it has not shortened in time. The importance of sleep is absolutely vital. I think we're just scratching the surface with the research that you're doing and all your colleagues. Uh, but it's truly fascinating. I think that once we learn more, like you're talking about sleep engineering, I feel like we're going to learn so much more about the brain, brain function and sleep. So again, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Power. Truly a fascinating interview and, and, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Happy to talk with you. Take care.